Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the best chess tournament, not just of 2024, but oh my goodness, maybe of the last decade plus. This is the 2024 candidates, and this is round number 13 of 14 rounds. It is a very tight race to determine who is going to win the entire event and play for the next World Chess Championship title. And round 13 was everything we could have asked for and more. And I'm going to get into the games. If you give me one minute of your time, today I am sponsoring my own video. A lot of you have my book. This book came out October 2023. Now, I've got a new thing for you. This is called the Chess Deck. This is a very beautiful and elegant deck of cards. And essentially what this is, is a bunch of different openings, puzzle themes, chess puzzles, and so on and so forth. And it is called the chess deck. And it's kind of a sibling product of the book. And it's on pre-order right now. It's a very beautiful present. It's very elegant, very nicely done. I'll put a link in the description. If you'd like to add it to your collection of things that I have made related to chess, please do. Uh, if you buy it to learn things, y y you might already know a handful of those things, but it's a very nice present for somebody just looking to get into, the ch into chess. And it makes for a very nice uh, little coffee table topping. Uh, my friends, here we go. Today we're gonna do our recap in reverse. I've always started with games like by Hikaru and some of the other you know, players. Out of respect for the people that are playing to win the candidates right now, I'm gonna quickly go through the other games kind of as a quick uh, uh, derf, if you will. That was one of the worst pronunciations you've ever heard. So we're on the women's side to start. Humpy Konaru versus Anna Muzichuk. This one, a Queen's Gambit declined. We're going to go through these quickly because these players are not playing for a first place finish. And at the end of the day, that is what matters in the Candidates Tournament. These two played a Queen's Gambit declined very early, traded some pieces. It was Bishop versus Knight, a weird King positioning by Black. And the players are fighting to their credit. But like I said, at this point in the event, we need to respect the players that are contending for a first place finish. This one goes to a long Queen Endgame and they played for quite a long time. Black was definitely putting some pressure, but ultimately, the players made a draw. Also, Nurgul Salimova and Katsurina Lagno. For some reason, I took away a point from Nurgul in this game. Uh, she had 12. Uh, and um, Nurgul versus Lagno. Neither of these players, by the way, very similar looking game in terms of the Catalan to the previous. Uh, this game also ended in Black having some sort of pressure on White and then actually, you know, Nurgul being under severe pressure uh, but she manages to safeguard her king, and in a low time scramble, Lagno goes from completely winning to all of a sudden not winning at all, and it's a draw. Because rook h7 and queen c7 are threatened. It was dramatic, it was tense, but there was games all over the place. Now, here is perhaps the craziest sequence from the women's side. Tan Zhongyi versus Goryachkina was a relatively straightforward game. It was a relatively straightforward end game, and it ends in a draw. So Tan Zhongyi has eight and a half points out of 13. So she is eight and a half out of 13. Going into the final round, Lei Tingjie can catch her with a win, and she's playing Vaishali, who's on a three game winning streak. But after a relatively boring opening, it was White who emerges with an advantage. So Black takes massive risk in this game to try to play for a win. I also just realized I did not have peace sounds enabled. Now I do. Queen d3 and Vaishali had pressure this entire game. She knows Lei has to win to tie Tan Zhong Yi for the lead going into the final round. And Lei was a fighter. She fought and she fought and she got back to the advantage. Now what was insane about this game is that it got to an end game of minor pieces and there was no chance ever for Black to play for a win. Takes, takes, queen and five versus queen and five. Lei is just gonna have to take the draw and she's gonna have to be half a point behind Tan Zhong Yi. Except she just loses the game, she loses. She blunders a queen trade in a queen end game and white just puts her king in the center and is completely winning. She's winning because the pawn dominates the two pawns, that's it. She's just winning. A4, king e5, and black literally resigns because I go d6 and I run and I eat those pawns and I win. So instead of going into the final round down half a point, Lei loses right at the end and is now a point behind Tan Zhong Yi. So if Tan makes a draw in the final round, she wins the candidates. That's it. It's, it's her and Lei. And that's all. 
And that's why, you know, like I said, I mean, I the, the summaries are getting shorter and shorter because in the candidates, you're either first or last, except last year when second place mattered. But Tan Zhong Yi is very close to winning. It's probably a 90% chance at this point. Uh, in the open, we had a boss of Invidit. Now, I love uh, these guys and they've put on a, a very good display but they are not playing for first place. Abbasov is playing, you know, obviously for pride and rating and, you know, who isn't. Vidit had a very pleasant position from the early opening, but ultimately uh, he was unable to capitalize. He had a very nice space advantage. Look at Abbasov, by the way. I mean, Abbasov showed up today like he had a doctor's appointment. Uh, he played so fast, then he started thinking, obviously, he got out of his prep. And, uh, yeah, they just repeated the position. So... We got here, and Vidit was like, I don't think I can make progress without taking much risk, and they make a draw, and, um, you know, Vidit could play for more, but it's a little tough after losing two games. He opts uh, not to play for more, and that was your six minutes of introduction. All right? That was your six minutes of introduction, and the three most important games of the day just took place and they were absolutely unbelievable. I'm going to take a sip of this, and then I'm going to get into these games. Also, seriously, check out the chess deck. It's sick. It's really nice. They worked for like a year on this thing. Okay. Yan Yipomnishi, seven and a half. Versus Hikaru, seven and a half. Tomorrow, Fabiano Caruana with white versus Yan Yipomnishi with black. Tomorrow, Hikaru with white versus Gukesh with black. So here's what has to happen. Yan needs to beat Hikaru, okay? Hikaru, for the first time in this candidates, according to statistics, has a 40% chance to win the tournament. This game, Caruana needs to beat Prague with black to even be in the conversation and if he loses, it's over. If he draws, it also could be over. And now Gukesh has to beat Faruja because Faruja's struggling. And also Gukesh needs to stay in the running. Three guys have seven and a half, and one guy has seven. We begin with Yanyi Pomnishi versus Hikaru Nakamura. Pawn to e4. And I was pretty I, 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 I was pretty certain, not shocked, I was pretty certain Hikaru was going to go e5. Hikaru's approach to this game was going to be, I'm okay with the draw, because tomorrow, if my boy Gukesh gets it done, if I'm half a point behind Gukesh, I can still beat him with white. That would be Hikaru's strategy. So this didn't surprise me. Knight f3, knight c6, bishop to b5. This surprised me, because you can play the Berlin. Hikaru, if you look at Hikaru's database over the last few years, when he doesn't want to lose with black, bro plays the Berlin. All right? Bro thinks his name is like Hikahu, all right? Like, like the way they would say it in German. I mean, he plays the freak in Berlin. Now, I think Nepo probably did like eight hours of homework. And also, he showed earlier in this event, he had that very interesting idea against uh, Vidit in the Berlin endgame. You might remember, it was this, this, it was knight c3, and then he played like h3, knight h2, f4, g4, this kind of concept. Hikaru plays a6. Hikaru plays a Spanish. And here, this is a move that no one plays, no one plays like that. And the idea of bishop to c5, I swear to you, is to not put the knight on f6. Knight f6 is a mainline Spanish, played millions of times. Bishop c5 is the turbo Spanish. You play bishop c5, and then you are not playing knight f6, you are playing knight to e7 which is crazy. You reinforce your knight with a knight, your f-pawn frequently needs to go to f6, and your knight goes to g6 to support the center. Hikaru plays into e4, e5, which I expected, but then he deviates, he doesn't play the Berlin. Instead, he says, Jan, bishop c5, baby. You're gonna have to beat me in this surprise weapon of a Spanish. This is a gangster move by Hikaru, who continues to surprise people every single round, like so it seems. And he's won three games in a row. Now, Jan plays castles and c3. He also could have played c3, d4 right away. The idea for black is after c3, the bishop goes there, and then you reinforce your center with the knight and with this pawn, uh, with the knight on g6 and with the pawn on d6. That's kind of what happens, but in a different move order. Knight e7, knight g6, and now the bishop goes back to a7. Now, to the untrained eye, this move wins a pawn, okay? dc6, 
95, 95, DE5. I mean, it looks like there is a pawn to be won. But black gets very active play with queen to h4, targeting this pawn. Very strong bishop. And the bishop on a7 is just a menace. I mean, this position is very tough. And there's even a move here, rook g8, with, as you might imagine, the intention to play g5 and bishop to g4. So, very tough position. There's a lot of very complicated lines. Jan plays a move that has been played many, many times before. f6, comes back to e3, castles knight bd2. We're in a position that has been explored some hundred times. Pragnananda, actually, himself, this guy, plays this line a lot, but in rapid games, mostly. So we have bishop e3, Hikaru castles, knight d2, king h8, getting off of this diagonal. And this is where we begin the middle game. So this position has been reached before. Jan plays rookie one. So Jan spends three minutes, all right? According to theory, the move d5 has been tried, bishop c2 has been tried, <coughs> and rookie one has been tried. Rookie one. Now, black has two choices. Open the position, or lock the position like this. d6. Play a long maneuvering game. You're not worried about moves like d5 as, as black, but you are worried about moves like h3, and your bishop just can't really go anywhere. Goes to e6, you get forked. So bishop d7 might be possible. Then white will play knight f1 and knight g3. And the thing is, like, at some point, white has more improving moves than you. So Hikaru takes on d4. And takes on d4 again. And then takes on d4 again. And then he plays d5. So as it turns out, this is the idea. And now Nepo takes on d5. Okay. Hikaru takes back on d5, and knight to e4 is played with the intention of playing knight c5 and knight c3. Now, as you might imagine, something weird happened here, okay? d5, ed, and for some reason, Hikaru spent a lot of time on that. And maybe he was thinking knight f4 to take or go to d3. He'll probably talk about it in his own coverage. But Jan went here... And at this point, the engine was saying that the line for black is b6 first, so there's no knight c5, rook c1, queen d8. And now there is no knight c5, knight e6. Hikaru played queen d8 pretty quickly. And suddenly the commentators were like, oh, Hikaru messed this up, and he did. It's plus one. It's plus one. Did Hikaru mix up the move order? Like, did he remember that he was supposed to play queen d8, but forgot that it was with b6? Because now the best move here for white is d5. And the point is knight c5, knight e6 is suddenly very powerful. Like, now you're getting a pawn here, which you're not supposed to be doing with black. And suddenly, after bishop to, uh, excuse me, after knight c4 and queen d8, d5 is a very powerful idea. I don't know what Hikaru had prepared there. B6. Then white can play bishop c6. Rook c1, queen d2. Maybe queen c2, queen a4. Something like that. But Nepo spent a long time after queen d8. And he went here. Spent 12 minutes. And this move d5 is a major question mark. He didn't play it. And Hikaru, according to deep analysis, was quite a bit worse. And I do wonder, was it an opening mix-up? I don't know. Obviously, he's going to explain, he's going to talk about it. But there was this moment here that this move d5 with a very clear plan would have posed very serious problems. But in the game, this, this misstep, and Hikaru now takes over. He says, Jan, let's go, get in. You know why he says that? Because there is no pawn. Now, there is no pawn. Whereas, if there was one, oh, let's just say like this, this would be a huge problem for black. The pawn's two squares away from queening. It's a massive problem. All right, so b6 and Jan does something inexplicable here. Everything in white's position, everything is pointing toward going to e6. As I just showed you, this move d5 to go to e6, in the game to go to e6, Jan goes back. 13 minutes spent, and he backs up. And this is when you realized Hikaru's about to take over this game. Because this is not what we want. 
I don't know what Jan didn't like here. He obviously didn't like Knight F4, but he's not losing. Like, the game is on here. It's a game. But he goes back. The idea being that if Hikaru takes this pawn, gets greedy, there's this nice move, Knight E5. You have to trade queens, and then I can do takes, takes, rook D1. I'm down a pawn, but these bad boys are getting on the seventh rank. It's going to be terrible for Hikaru. So Hikaru just doesn't do it. He says, I, I don't want the pawn. Now Nepo plays knight e5, and Hikaru is threatening to mate Jan. So the game has completely turned around. Jan plays d5, disconnecting the bishop's vision, but allowing the pawn to become a target. And now he has to defend his target. And Hikaru here spends roughly 20 minutes and comes up with this move c5. It's a... Really nice. He it, it, it doesn't spend 20 minutes on Rook D8. He spent 20 minutes on Rook D8. I apologize. But the combi 20 minutes. But the combination of these moves. C5. It's a very clever idea. Now, the pawn snuck past the blockade. Can't take. I mean, I know Ampassant is forced. But <coughs> sometimes it's not. And C5 is really clever. Now, Hikaru's taking over. What do I mean by Hikaru's taking over? Well, let's say white plays like Rook C1. Black is going to threaten to mate somehow. Like, let's say Knight H4. And then Black is just going to play f4. And b5, c4. Like, again, I'm just very hypothetically, this is what Black is going to get pretty soon. And then you're going to take this, and you're winning. So here, Jan attacks the queen. Hikaru goes here. Jan goes back. And we have a very tense moment. There's footage of the players not wanting to take a draw. They're watching the other games. You understand, like, the insanity of that? No other sport has this. You don't know what decision to make in your game because no other sport is a tie in, a, in this kind of a high-stakes event. Ties are broken by penalty kicks and overtime. You're watching the other games, and you don't know if you want to take a draw because what if one of them wins, and suddenly the chances tomorrow are completely different? But they think for a while... And they ultimately repeat moves. And the game ends in a draw. And actually, Jan has to claim and play knight back to f3, and they do repeat. Uh, and it was funny, because this position occurred three times. But this is a different position, because here the legal move of en passant is possible, which is very funny. So this position, this position, and this position are not the same, because in this position, white has this move. Very clever, but... It was a three-move repetition. They both have eight. Now these guys have eight, and they're going to watch the other two games. Gukesh has a chance to get to eight and a half. Fabiano's only chance is to win this game and get to eight. If he loses or draws, his chances are less than like 2%. Okay? Prague versus Fabiano. Fabi does what any good man does when he needs to win a game. He plays the Sicilian defense. Knight f3. Knight c6. The same Rosalimo, knight f6. Fabiano's played this the third time in this candidates. All right? Takes, takes. d3, queen c7. Knight bd2. We get a very locked position, very normal stuff. Knight goes to c4. And now we have this transformation of structure. Dark squared bishop type of game. Holes in the white position on d4. Holes in the black position, maybe on the light squares over here. Knight f8 back. Queen g4. And Fabi is under pressure early. And Prague has a very pleasant position here. And right here was the biggest moment of the opening. Where Prague did something I will not understand at all. I do not understand it. Because I see a queen and a knight. I see a bishop. Who is the only piece not participating? The Rook. I'm not talking about Rook B1. But that move is fine too. I'm talking about F4. I don't know why he didn't play F4. F6. Knight F3. G6. Queen H3. EF4. And then here you play E5. And what you do is you just... You, you bulldoze the position. You can't take because Rook E1 wins the Queen. And basically, if you're Prague, you, you play this position. Maybe he didn't like it. Maybe he thought, I'm just down a pawn. Right? He didn't like this. 
but you gotta go for this because I got news for you. You see how Black is gonna play these two moves? If you don't play them, he's gonna play them anyway. And this is just a turbo tar charge version. And suddenly my man Prague, watch the next five moves. Dude is backing up like he is just getting attacked in an alley. Fabiano Caruana put on a mask and just started throwing fists at him and trying to take his wallet, all right? I know they're playing in Toronto. It's probably not that bad, but I'm from New York. It's a fair analogy. Uh, look at this. The knight is darting backwards. This knight is arriving on D4, F4. Now he's got he's to try to get his rook out of the way to put his knight on F1 to go knight E3, knight F5. Now the queen has to go to E3. Now the queen goes to E2. Now the knight goes to F1. He's just, all oh, every move is backwards. Fabiano marching him down on the side of the board with G4 and H4. But Prague was ahead of his, he was ahead of the curve here because he baits Fabiano into the only thing that he can accomplish. Fabi did all of this, and as fate would have it, the best, the absolute best that Fabiano Caruana is going to get here is the knight in the center, is the weakening of the light squares, and is the winning of the rook. And that's it. Now, black can't move any pawn. And guess what? I have the knight now. And I'm putting it right there. And who's getting rid of it? And guess what? Then I'm going to go F3. And then I'm going to trade. And then I'm going to get my bishop out. And I'm going to support my A pawn. And then I'm going to play rook F1. And suddenly you're like, wait a minute. I'm up a rook for a knight. Why am I not winning? And over the course of the next 10 moves, Prague fights back from an absolutely atrocious position. The players shuffle, they shuffle, they shuffle. Fabi probably should have played b6 or a5. They both make it to the 40th move. And on the 40th move, Prague breaks out. And Prague's advantage is at its minimal, like, away from Fabiano since move 15. In this position, it was minus point, you know, it was like right here, it was minus point eight. It was a terrible turn of events. And Fabiano somehow lets it slip. And the pawn going to a5 combined with knight f5, the engine is saying, white can't even lose anymore. What has Fabiano done? Oh my goodness. Now, neither guy wants to touch his queen side. Computer is constantly screaming for a5, but you never really want to play a5 because if black starts trading, he's going to break out of his position. So bishop d2, queen h5. Queens are off the board. Who does that benefit? Why would Fabi do that? Look, Prague just completely seals it. The only thing Fabiano can do now to have any hope in this game is accomplishing the move b5. That's it. And he has to open things up. Let me just tell you, if Fabi plays something like b4, well, actually a5 by, you know, like, let's just say something like a6. Now this is a draw. This is a draw. This is a fortress. And there's other types of fortresses here. The computer doesn't get it because black is up material. And there's even more pure fortresses, like if black has a pawn in a5, like this, and, you know, like this is a complete draw. It's a draw. So Fabi has ruined his chances. And Prague just has to wait. Fabi goes king a6. And in this position, there's still like a way maybe to defend against b5. But Prague kind of allows it. And he has an idea in mind. His idea was very clever. It was Fabi can't go b5. Because I take on c5. I go here, here, and I take. Fabi can't get through, and I'm going to put my knight here and here, and I have very good chances. Knight to e3. Bishop d8. Bishop a3. This was Prague's idea. But he misses something insane. Rook b7. Bishop d6 attacking the rook. Black is winning with rook b1. What? Because when you trade everything, the pawn promotes. If you try to stop it, a4. What have you seen? Hero double pawns like this. And you can't stop a2. And if g5, 
A2, G6, A1, Queen, Queen G1, stops. Oh my god. Prague misses it. But so does Fabiano. And suddenly, within the span of a few moves, it's no longer even that bad. Bishop C1, now still, absolutely still, Fabiano is in the driver's seat. But he's lost one of his pawns. If he loses the A pawn, he's not winning this game. So he defends it. Rook A3, Bishop to B4, Rook A2, Fabi trying. 64 moves have been played, Rook, Rook B7, Bishop B2, it's back to equal. Oh my god, Fabiano's messed it up. Oh my god, Fabiano's messed it up. Rook B5, now C3. That is a big mistake. Prague in this position needed to go G5, removing the defense of the center, and then King G4, and all three of Black's pawns are on fire, leaving Black with one remaining pawn. That's it. This was apparently the right defensive idea. Prague goes here. It's too slow. Suddenly, we have a quick skirmish, and Fabiano gets in with his rooks. And then he sacrifices one of them, and the knight is falling, and Fabiano Caruana is in the clear, but it's not over yet. It is not over yet. He wins the knight, but look at this. If I turn off the eval bar here, you would all lose this position with, with white, with black, excuse me, and so would I. How are you stopping these pawns? Fabiano goes bishop c5. Rook c1 attacks the bishop. The king protects. g5. How do you stop these pawns? Okay, the bishop stops this pawn, but how do you stop this pawn? Okay, very easy. Rook b2. G6, Rook G2, then you lose! You lose! Because your Rook is not on the 8th rank. Oh my, what? So what is the evaluation here? Well, it's winning, but they don't know that. And you don't know that, right? Because you don't have the eval bar anymore. So Fabiano plays Bishop 2E7. He has three minutes. This is the most clutch that he has to be in his entire chess career. King G6. The king is going to F7. And Prague is about to save this game when Fabiano Caruana plays a4. Prague plays rook c8 to try to get rid of the bishop to get his pawns through. Prague plays rook e3. Uh, Fabiano plays rook e3. Bishop is hanging, but the pawn is the hero. Prague tries to stop him. If takes, there was just a2. Takes with check, and you offer a rook trade. And as fate would have it, both of them queen at the exact same time. A queen a2 check is played. A queen trade is unavoidable. This, this, pawn promotes, prog resigns. Fabi has eight. Oh my god. Fabi, Hikaru, and Nepo are tied for first going into the final round of the candidates. And they wait if Kukesh will win, lose, or draw. E4. E5. Knight f3, knight c6. A Berlin. A Berlin. By the way, d3. Bishop c5. And from the early opening, <coughs> Ali Reza came better prepared. Anish Giri on the live broadcast in this position said... This idea of a5 and putting the bishop back on a7, targeting the white king, not c7, is not something that Gukesh was ready for, and he chooses a plan where he runs into big trouble. d5. Ali Reza is better from the opening. This is a worse nightmare for Gukesh. He's in a worse position with the white pieces in 15 moves. The idea is that if you take, a4 removes your control of the center, and suddenly I'm completely dominating you here. Now, Gukesh is the youngest player in the candidates. He's 17. He's the, actually, I think the first or second youngest player to play a candidates ever. At some point, his nerves and his lack of experience and his youth have to interfere. And they have interfered in the opening of game number 13, right? Surely, right? I mean, he's so young. No? He says, you know what? All right. Maybe I don't have the best position in the world. We still have a whole lot to play for. Bishop e6. E d. C d. H3. Maybe I'm going to g4. And now Ali Reza plays rook e8. And for the life of me, I do not understand if he blundered this move bishop a4. Nine times out of ten, a bishop attacking a rook like this is stupid. It's just a waste of time. 
But in this particular case, if the rook goes to e7, you lose the knight. If the rook goes to f8, that's just stupid, and you lose control of the center. If you block, I win the pawn on d5. So the only alternative is the one thing that Ali Reza Feruja does best. Take his shirt off and get into a fistfight. He doesn't have any documented instances of actually doing that, but the analogy works all the same. Ali Reza Feruja is a fighter. He's going to fight. e4 takes, takes. And he is attacking Gukesh over the next, like, five to seven moves from all angles. The pawn on a3, reminiscent. May I remind you of another pawn on a3. And let me tell you something right now. If we go to an endgame, Gukesh is going to have a migraine because of that pawn, which is why Gukesh says, no, Ali Reza, you can't come here. And in fact, I'm going to just not even let you, you know, I'm going to leave that pawn right where it is. And I'm going to come back for it in the future. Ali Reza plays f5, and he is better. This is a very, very bad situation for Gukesh. All right? f4 on the way. Now, let's not forget, Gukesh lost to Firuja, the most heartbreaking game that he's played in the 12 games that he has played in the candidates. Bad memories. Yes, he's looking to avenge them, but this is the biggest moment of the young man's career. He takes on c5, and he plays rook d1. And Ali Reza is in prime position to uncork savagery on the white position. You give one more move to black, it's over. It is over. The attack has arrived. Gukesh has to act now. One of the things he can do is play queen d2 and try to get a queen trade. He says, no, I'm not trading the queens. Why would I trade the queens? That's what Gotham Chess would do, and that's why he covers my games. Queen to e7. And my man Gukesh says, if f4 is so damn good, I'll f play it myself. He plays f4 himself, destabilizing the position in front of his king, ready to put the knight on e3. You cannot take en passant because I take this. This is a big move. There is an argument to be made that Ali Reza should have played f4 right away. He should have not even allowed this to happen. He didn't like f4 because he didn't like queen g4 probably. Fair, but now Gukesh plays f4 himself. Ali Reza plays knight f6 and in this position plays g5 straight away and blows open the position completely. If you take on g5, knight d7, knight e5, knight f3 is one of the worst things that you can allow. So g5. Computer's not a huge fan because of knight e3. Now, both guys have an open king. Queen f7. King h2. Knight to h5. Both guys have no time. They have three more moves to make. Ali Reza has two and a half minutes. But Ali Reza did this once to Gukesh already. Ali Reza now has one minute to make two moves, or he loses the game on time. And in this position, Gukesh plays rook g1, rook g6. And the players repeat. They repeated. You saw that? They repeated. They make 40 moves. Extra 30 minutes. Everybody take a deep breath. Relax. And to my shock, in this position, after spending 20 of his 35 minutes, Gukesh repeated the position. And for the first time in history, going into the final round of the candidates, four players are tied with eight. No draw. Gukesh says, we play on and one of us will lose. Rook g1, king g1. Five pawns each, this pawn begging to be let through, potentially going to get captured, a protected pass pawn, a majority of two on one, imbalances galore. Ali Reza plays king h8. Gukesh plays king f2. Computer wasn't a huge fan of king h8. It really wanted the knight to come to e6. And then after this, it really wanted queen g7 and then an infiltration of the white position. It really liked that. Ali Reza doesn't do that. He puts his king on h8. King f2, and now Gukesh is winning. What a genius. It's paid off. He needs to play queen h6. He doesn't. A massive missed opportunity. And now Ali Reza Firuja finds knight to e6, queen f5, and queen g7, giving up his knight, but the infiltration arrives and the game will end in a draw. 
But instead of that, he offers a queen trade. And this will probably go down as the strangest move of this candidate's tournament. Because the speed at which Ali Reza Feruja traded the queens was about a minute. He didn't think about knight e6. He must have been very down about his position. But after takes, takes, maybe he only calculated these two, three moves. But rook d6 is the idea. And the point is, you just put your knight on d5, defend yourself, pressure this, and march your pawns. Ali Reza Feruja blunders after the time control, and with less than 10 minutes to go, Gukesh is winning. Knight to d5 is coming. He has won the pawn. Ali Reza darts in with his own knight, and there's a pawn promoting. Oh my goodness. Gukesh plays rook b6 with five minutes remaining on the clock. Knight to c2 from Ali Reza. e3, e2, e1. You can't take the pawn on b7 because then e3, knight t4, if king e1, there's knight f3 and e2, and the pawn is getting through. Which is what makes it all the more absurd that in this position, my man Gukesh played rook b7! Anyway, because if e3, king e2, knight t4, king d3, e2, knight f6, Arabian mate, unstoppable on h7, white allows a queen, and mates their opponent. Rook b7, and Gukesh just has to calm his nerves. One minute on the clock. He's been here before, and he messed it up against Feruja, and it was rooks and knights. But this time, no matter the amount of tricks, this man, Gukesh, was so clutch. I cannot understate how clutch this man was. The pawns go together. It doesn't matter that Ali Reza can get in on the second rank. The king goes to g3. The pawn will fall. b7, rook c8, and you queen before your opponent. And this man, Gukesh, for the first time in six years, another person, not named Jan Nipomnishi, leads the candidates tournament by themselves. I'm getting emotional even talking about it. Gukesh is ahead with eight and a half out of 13. The final round, Hikaru versus Gukesh. Fabiano Caruana with white versus Jan Nipomnishi. If Gukesh beats Hikaru, he wins the candidates. The other game doesn't matter. If Hikaru beats Gukesh, the winner of the other game will play him for a tiebreak. If Hikaru and Gukesh make a draw, the same thing that I just said, Fabi Nepo, they will play Gukesh for a tiebreak. Fabi versus Nepo, somebody has to win. Somebody has to win. What an incredible tournament. And if you're still here, seriously, check out the chess deck. I, I got to get like pre-orders in. They got to count this stuff and, you know, check it out. You don't, you know, I'm just telling you, like, get mad at me if I don't talk about it. I'll see you all tomorrow. And if the players are tied, there is a tie break on April 22nd. Get out of here.